Thanks, Taryn and John. How are we doing this morning, Zion Church? On the first service, I said this evening, I think sometimes it's like the dark, the lights, man, it throws me off a little bit. Or I have three kids, guys, and one is four weeks old. So reference for time, or four weeks old, reference for time. Uh, but Taryn, John, thank you for having me. Me, Lindy, our Circle family, we love Zion Church. It's a joy to be here. It's an honor to be here. Man, the presence of God is in this house this morning. And I love to preach, but I also tremble at his word because it's a privilege to come into an atmosphere like this in the presence of God and to open the scriptures and to go after Jesus with you. Man, it is a holy privilege, and I'm so honored uh, to be with you this morning. It's incredible. You may not realize it because it's becoming your normal week, but it's incredible what God is doing in this church. It's four years old, right? Everybody say, that's young. <laughs> it's four years old, and two of those years were in COVID, and I'm getting to know Taryn and John, and Joe's been, the, isn't Joe the best? Come on. If you know Joe, you probably feel super loved and taken care of. But I'm getting to know the storyline here, what God's doing, and it really is profound. It really is not normal, but the kingdom of God isn't normal, so it's looking like the kingdom of God should look where things are growing and people say that shouldn't be growing, where people are doing extraordinary things, man. I, I've been getting so moved. I'm hearing more and more of the storyline. Uh, this event with the, the foster kids, man, that touches my heart. I'm gonna share a little bit more in my message about that. But um, serving the foster kids of our generation, I feel like that's like a heartbeat in this church. Um, if you're a part of that wraparound care family, I so honor you, so bless you, grace for you. Um, I'm praying t this morning is a cold cup of water that refreshes you to keep going, um, that encourages you to keep going, but um, it really is a joy, guys. I believe that we are living in extraordinary times in Southern California. Now, I feel like most preachers might say that to stir them up, but I'm not saying that to hype you up. I truly believe we are living in extraordinary times in Southern California. I moved here in 2012, so about 12 years ago, going on my 13th year now. Um, and when I moved here, I came with a small team of circuit riders. Um, just really quick, who here is familiar with circuit riders? Who here when I say that are like, are you a horseback riding guy? What's going on? Anybody? It's okay. No, you can, you know, I, I love it when people are like, man, I'm in the minority, half hand. Um, no, you can, you can interact with me. I'm comfortable with that. Um, so I've been a part of circuit riders since basically the beginning. Um, we're a part of Youth with a Mission. It's a missionary organization. And I've been there for the last... 12, 13 years, we live in Huntington Beach, primarily a little bit in Costa Mesa now too. We got a little bit outgrew Huntington Beach. Um, but we started out with about 10 of us on staff, believing that God wanted to reach this next generation with salvation, with revival, and equipping the next generation to bring the kingdom of God to all spheres of society. So huge vision, right? Radical vision. I remember um, I came from a bigger missions base that was on fire. And when I landed in Southern California, my eyes were bright and I was ready to rock. I was like, here we go. Every place for Jesus. I'm going to University of Southern California. Dude, do you know God, huh? What about you, man? We should see Jesus move on your campus. Oh, tone it down a little bit, bro. Take it easy. And I feel like I wasn't always met faith with faith. But can I tell you, now feels far different than when we first landed. I'm telling you, I think we are living in days of great harvest where salvation it's gonna be normal every Sunday. It's gonna be normal every Monday. It's gonna be normal every Tuesday where we are gonna see the power of God move in Southern California because I think we are in a special sovereign time of God moving. It's not gonna be this church. It's gonna be the church together, linked arms together, seeing Jesus move in extraordinary ways, his love and his kingdom advancing all over Southern California. Amen? Amen. Amen. I wanted to say that before I got going. Um, I'm also gonna turn off this right now. Um, I'm also part of the SEND, which I don't know if you know what the SEND is. It's big arena gatherings to catalyze the church and to great action to take their part in the Great Commission. We have a gathering going right now in the UK, um, and there's like six to 7,000 uh, UK friends gathering, signing up for their missional assignment literally right now. Um, the text is blowing up because a month ago, it didn't even look like a thousand people were gonna come. So everyone's blown away, the hunger. We live in days of great awakening. No, I'm telling you, don't believe the report of the media if you listen to it too much. 
believe the report of heaven. There will be no end to the increase of his government. There will be no end to Jesus moving and advancing. We are going to see every nation touch. And I believe that America's days aren't done. I believe there are great days of revival and awakening ahead for America. And it's gonna come through normal people like you and me. It's not gonna be a person with a microphone. It's gonna be all of us together, linking arms, winning the lost, bringing people to Jesus and doing our part in the Great Commission. All right, that's not my message though. I just got excited, guys. I think, go one more minute. Guys, in Clifton Strengths Finders, which is like a personality test, my number one is optimism. You might be able to tell already. But when I got in the atmosphere of worship with you guys, which I don't know about you, I wanted worship just to keep going. It's like, man, cancel the message. Let's sing about the blood for another 45 minutes. We'll be good to go. Let's go preach. We're good. But when I got in the atmosphere of the presence of God with you guys, I was filled with great hope. And hearing about what God's doing in San Clemente, I think, man, what's going to happen through Zion Church has only just begun. And I love your city. And I hope it keeps going and I can keep visiting you guys because this is one of me and my wife's favorite cities in Southern California. We did our five-year anniversary down here. So shout out you guys for living here. You're smart. And... Another thing, I have three kids. Um, oldest name is Parker. Uh, second name, whoever came up with the name of this church, genius, because my second son's name is Zion. So, oh, look, the, that got the tender right there. Um, didn't happen for a service. We got a tender service here. Here we go. Um, uh, his name is Zion, and so I guess I'm allowed to show favorites because you guys named your church Zion Church, so I love it. Um, and then my youngest, I'm now a girl dad. As of a little over four weeks ago, June 4th, my wife gave birth to our daughter. Her name is Brightly, um, and she is just already changing our lives so quickly. It's incredible. Um, any dads in here that have gr girls? Yeah? Did any of you guys get like a new tender spot you didn't know existed like right away? I heard a sure. All right, that's good enough. That counts. That counts. Um, it was like already, it's like, it's been four weeks. I'm like, I need more ammunition and more weapons. Um, but I also have already had like, man, one day I'm gonna give her away. She's gonna be a bride. I was like, what is, ha what is happening right now? Um, and it's so fun to be a dad. So three kids and they're amazing. My boys are 10 and a half months apart. You'll hear the story about how that happened. Um, my wife did not get pregnant back to back that fast. Um, it's an incredible journey that we went on, and you'll hear about that in just a minute. But, um, man, such an honor. So excited. I'm going to jump in right now um, because my message today, I've had to discipline myself because the message that I felt the Lord put on my heart um, to preach you guys today is not necessarily pure optimism. At the end, it is, but my message today has some challenge, but I want to share it because I don't know about you, um, the last number of years, in the midst of God doing amazing things, in and through circuit riders with me and my wife, our fam, I've been so encouraged, different churches. I also have seen some friends that I started the journey with begin to fade off. It's like every other month right now, I feel like I'll see an Instagram post of a friend that started in zeal following Jesus, and it's like, man, they're deconstructing. They're not sure if Jesus really is the Messiah anymore. Man, they started on fire, but man, they're straight into a party lifestyle now. What happened? And so I wrestle with like, man, it's not just zeal, which is important. I'm not devaluing that. It's not just that excitement that's going to take us to the end. There's got to be some keys in the gospel that will take us to the end. Because I don't know about you. I don't want to be five years from now being like, man, the road got too tough. Lindy, you're a great mom. Take care of the kids. I'm out. I can't follow, it's, I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna follow that train. What stats would say is that some of the younger generation might be fading away. And I'm like, man, that can't be the storyline. I want the storyline that 10 years from now, you look in my eyes and it's not conjured up. There's more fire for Jesus than there was 10 years ago. That when I'm 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, the fire only burns brighter. I think that the invitation to live that lifestyle is available. I don't think that Christianity is like a, whoa, I'm stoked when I'm young, and then it fades. And your church gives me hope because I feel like every person I meet, no matter where they're at in life, I feel like they've been pretty stoked. I saw it in worship. But I believe, oh, the keys just faded, man, there it went. 
I believe today that Jesus has something for us, um, an invitation for us that will sound like not an easy invitation, but let me tell you, it's going to be worth it. There's something he's gonna invite us into afresh, and many of you will already be living this. I can feel it. You don't have 10 foster families and 50 wraparound. You don't do this without already having a big yes to Jesus to embrace the cost of following him. But I'm telling you, there's an invitation today. If you're new, if it's your first time, if you've been following Jesus for 30 years, if you've been consistently following for five, wherever you are at, there is an invitation from Jesus for you today. Can we go to the scripture? Let's go to the scripture. If you got your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 14. We're gonna read the whole thing, and then I'm gonna go through it kind of exegetically, which just means verse by verse. Sound good? Big word that basically just means I'm gonna go verse by verse. I'm gonna give you my heart on it and what I feel like the Lord has been speaking to me as I prayed for you guys, as I leaned in. God, what do you wanna do at Zion on Sunday morning? We're gonna go after it. But really quick, setting context, I know, have you guys been enjoying the Luke series? It's been good? Um, I love y'all's daily Bible reading. I said it to the first service and to y'all's staff. I was like, I just want somebody to do this for like any of my notes. It looks so cool and so beautiful. I, I want to do the Bible reading plan. Do it for the whole Bible. Um, I love y'all's Bible reading plan. This 12-week series through Luke. I get to jump in. I think it's week seven. Uh, but the context, I love this book because Luke is a doctor. And Dr. Luke is precise in detail and he is precise in his words. He is building, according to the first few verses of the book, he's building an orderly account Originally, his audience was Theophilus, but now it's for all of us. But he was building an orderly account for a primarily Gentile audience. He wanted somebody to see from beginning through where the church had come through Acts. Because remember, Luke is just part one of the book. Acts is part two. It's really like two volumes of the same book. Does that make sense? So Luke is writing an orderly account, building a case for who? For Jesus. Why? That Jesus is the savior of the world, not just for Jew, but for Gentile as well. So Luke is building this extraordinary detailed account and he doesn't mess up any words. If you're a doctor and you're not detailed, I'm not sure I want you to be my doctor. If I'm getting surgery on anything, whether it's a knee, an ankle, heart, you had better be precise because if you're not precise, I could be in big trouble, right? So I love that it was the Lord's wisdom to move through Luke, to write a gospel account this precise with Luke and Acts. So where we're at contextually, though, Jesus has been doing miracles. How many of you guys love miracles? It was hard for me, my optimist self, let me tell you, it was hard for me not to pick the two miracle stories in Luke 13 and 14 where Jesus heals on the Sabbath. I love that because, one, I love when people get touched by the power of God. And let me tell you, I know that you guys are a believing church. We prayed for the sick in first service. God still moves in power. The, the mother of circuit riders was sick for 38 years with Lyme's disease, bedridden. I knew her for 10 years, mostly bedridden. In 2019, at the first sin gathering in Orlando, Florida, at the very end of the day, one guy prayed for her, didn't put a hand on her, said, Lyme's disease is no big deal for God. Boom, the power of God flushed through her entire body. She was healed in a moment, in a moment. In the last five years, I have seen Christy Brent in staff meetings, every... She is fully 100% healed. You will never convince me that healing was just for then. Healing is for today. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. It's one of his names. He doesn't change. It's who he is. Now, you might be like, but Chase, I haven't experienced it. Yeah, I've also experienced that side too, which is another sermon. But the pops of our movement, Brian Brent, he passed away from an autoimmune disease. Wife was healed. He was not. Two and a half years ago, a father figure in my life, I was a, he was a dear friend. We prayed the same that we did for Christy, but the Lord chose to take him home. There's a mystery involved in there, but it doesn't change who God is. He's a healer. So when I was reading Luke 13 and 14 and praying, I was like, oh, Lord, this would be fun. We can confront religion and we can pray for the sick. This will be awesome. And then the Lord said, last passage. I was like, but Lord, I love to smile and get people pumped and pray for the sick. Let's do it. That's not where the Lord led me. So at this point in the storyline, Jesus has healed the sick. He's cleansed the leper. He's cast out demons. He's multiplied, multiplied food. Can I get an amen? amen? You guys should be a little more excited about that. There are, there are some nights when I grill a steak so perfectly 
I feel like it would just only be right if the Lord would multiply. Man, if, if I could see that multiplication, that's it. So he's doing all these things, and he's even confronting the religious Pharisees and leaders of his time. The two healings in Luke 13 and 14, he did in front of them on a Sabbath, and somebody who was sick for 18 years, she couldn't stand upright, gets healed in a moment, and the first response from the Pharisees is, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Rather than, whoa, she was sick and then got healed. Sometimes, don't we overcomplicate things as Christians sometimes? When good news comes, we should celebrate. Jesus is frustrated, so the next chapter, he does it again. Is it right to do good or to do bad on the Sabbath? They stay silent. Boom, heals a guy that had swelling with an issue called dropsy in the scriptures. So at this point in the storyline, though, the crowds are taking note. Jesus is awesome. I mean, he's moving in power. When he talks, it's different when the other guys talk. When he talks, there's authority. There's power. Even demons submit to him. Like, we got to see what this guy's going to do next. But the storyline right here in Luke is Jesus has been doing all this. His ministry is exploding. It's like revival. If I was him, I was like, man, just keep going to Galilee. What are you doing? No, he has set his sights now, though, on Jerusalem. In the midst of all his revival ministry, Jesus has a deeper passion even. There's a deeper battle that he has come to win on your, ha- to win on your half and my behalf. There's something that he has to do. So he has fixed his eyes on Jerusalem and he's begun to allude to his disciples, hey, I've got to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer. The storyline of like, man, but so much power. So I've got to go to Jerusalem. So I want you to picture Jesus at the helm of this group with his eyes fixed on Jerusalem. I've got to go somewhere and the multitudes are following him. They're wondering what's Jesus going to do next. That's where we're at in the storyline. Okay, turn with me to Luke 14. 25 to 35, I didn't do this first service, but we're gonna do it here. Um, If you wanna read it out loud with me, join me. I think the power today is not in a good word. I'll say the power today is in scripture. I don't care how charismatic I could get or what great line I could say, what will change our hearts and lives forever is the word of God. It's living and active. Every word is scripture. I don't care what podcast you listen to, what smart guy thinks that it's not. No, scripture is scripture. The power of life is in scripture. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. This is where the power is at, okay? That's why I'm gonna keep coming back to it. All right, my little sermonette on the power of scripture. I love it. If you wanna read it with me, join me. Sound good? Okay, Luke 14, 25 to 35. Three, two, one. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Let's keep going. We're gonna do the whole thing. Do we have the whole thing? There we go, keep going. Three, two, one. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Everybody say, stay salty. Stay salty. That's the title of my message, and I forgot to say it for service. You guys got it, though. Okay, here we go. We're going to go as quick as we can because I really do feel like God wants to move. I think there's some of you today... I said this, I feel the same thing. There's some of you today that have never had a moment to really fully surrender your life to Jesus. Today is your day. Today's the day of salvation. I'm telling you, there are some hearts today, the presence of God was moving on you in worship. You felt your heart getting tugged. I feel like the Holy Spirit's gonna pull you in fully today. It's a day of surrendering fully to Jesus, okay? All right, back to verse 25. 
Jesus had great crowds accompanying him, like I said, and he turned and said to them. So he's about to say something to the crowds. This isn't just to his 12 core disciples. Um, this isn't to the religious leaders this time. He is saying something to the crowds. I put myself in there like, he's saying something to those that are just following Jesus. Like, what's he gonna say next? I wanna know what he's gonna say next. It must be important. If anyone, I'm in the ESV now in my Bible. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother. Okay, that's extreme language. I thought Jesus was the love guy. Chase, I thought you were the optimist. No, if anyone, by comparison, Jesus is using hyperbole. He's using exaggerated language because he wants to paint the picture very clearly that there can only be one number one thing in our life. He's saying, by comparison, if you can't hate your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, is he saying to actually hate them now? Okay, first started following Jesus. This was a tough line. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. First John, God is love. What's happening here, Jesus? We gotta stay in unity. No, he's not saying that we don't actually love our mom and dad, our wife and kids, or our brother. No, no, very, very different. What he's saying, though, is if any of those has the supreme place in our heart, it's out of order. What he's saying is that if you really want to follow me, if you really want to be my disciple, if you want to be like me, if you want to follow me, I've got to be the supreme, most important thing in your life. There's four points today to staying salty. The first one is Jesus has to stay supreme. Now, when we first experience salvation, that's easy, right? I got forgiven. This is good, man. Supreme, of course. But what happens in our Christian life sometimes is we go through hard things. Surprise, we're still on earth. It's not always easy. And sometimes Jesus saying supreme is like, man, sometimes it's tough to keep you first. Sometimes I got my own personal ambitions. Lord, I want to work out. Sometimes I want to do ABC, and it gets tested. Will we keep, G if you want to follow him, if you want to be a disciple, he's got to say the supreme, not just first, but he's got to be the supreme love of your life, and it can't be fake. You guys ever been around fake love? It'd be a bummer if Lindy was here and be like, my heart's space was, she's my wife, so I should love her. No, she's my wife, I get to love her. I, I get to love her the rest of my life. What a privilege. What a joy. When Jesus is supreme and first, our hearts lean should be like, I want to follow him with everything inside of me because I've tasted of his grace. I've tasted how good he is. I've seen it's worth any price. He's greater than anything else the world has to offer. He's supreme in my life. So that's the first thing to stay salty. Jesus has to be supreme. Are we there? You guys with me? Okay. It's about to heat up. You guys ready? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. A crossless Christianity is no Christianity at all. Jesus had his own sights set on the cross. Now, at the time for Jesus to say this, many of you are probably familiar with this, but if you're not, the cross was a Roman tool of excruciating death. There was quicker ways to kill somebody, but this was an invented way by man to have a very prolonged, painful death, and it was reserved. It wasn't reserved for citizens. It was reserved for the lowest of society. And Jesus is saying, like, I'm going to Jerusalem, and if you want to follow me, pick up yours too. But Jesus, a cross is like, it would make me like a sore thumb in society. I would stick out. People would probably mock me. That means I'm not living for myself. I have to go through painful things, hard things. Yeah. I'm also, yes, I've got pleasures evermore at my right hand, but I'm also the man of many sorrows. If you want to know me, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to be willing to pick up your cross. Because I'm going to hang on the only one that's going to destroy sin, but you've got to pick up your cross and live like me. And sometimes when that invitation comes, of like, man, pick up your cross. That one can be hard on the flesh, amen? Do I have any normal people in here like, man, sometimes it's not easy. But at the same time, aren't you glad 
that in this life that is a vapor, God didn't give us something so simple, but that he said, hey, in your weakness, I'm gonna give you grace to do what is not easy. I'm gonna give you grace to do what is hard and challenging. Do I have any guys in here that love to do hard things for no reason? I had some buddies. My, my buddy from kindergarten is here. He was in the first service. He had some friends in Kona that they wanted to hike the tallest mountain in Hawaii um, from sea. They wanted to touch the sea, and then they wanted to climb to the top of the mountain. It was like 50-something miles of hiking through the night in 24 hours. And in my mind, I said, I'm all down for the hard. I said, what's the, what's the purpose? To do it, dude. And, well, dude, we'll touch the water, then we'll be on top of the mountain. Hey, why don't you just drive like at least halfway? I mean, 24 hours, that's, you could probably die. Yeah, one of them almost did pass out from hypothermia. It was actually crazy. But then they got to the end, and you know what it was? We did it. <laughs> Were you pumped? Yeah, why? I don't know. We did something hard, man. There's something, I know that's a silly example, but there's something in us that we are wired to do challenging things. Why else would you train for marathons? Why else would you do things that are hard on your physical body to achieve something? You want to do the hard thing to get to an ultimate goal. Jesus is saying, hey, following me is not all roses, though it includes those. Sometimes there is a cross. There's going to be a test, a trial. I guarantee you, so the Bible says, it's going to come for every one of us. And if you'll pick up your cross, if you won't wait for it to come hit you, if you'll pick up your cross and follow me and say yes to what I'm inviting you into, you'll get to know me. You get to be my follower. I remember when me and Lydia had been uh, married for two years, and we had felt the Lord say, wait two years to start a fam, so we did. Um, and around two years, we started praying, and we really felt a series of dreams, too long of a story, a series of dreams we felt like we weren't supposed to start biologically. Um, we were supposed to start, we felt, through adoption. But I didn't know anything. I was very new um, to the whole uh, American foster care crisis. And so I started to study. I started to learn. We met with an adoption lawyer. I didn't feel peace. He was amazing. Nothing wrong with him. And I, I learned about the foster care system. I was like, oh, I think this is it. And Lindy was like, huh? I was like, yeah, I think this is it. She had another dream. Um, it's a great dream. I, I'll let her share it. Maybe we'll come back again. She can share it. Um, she wakes up in the dream, tells me, and she's like, hey, I think that we're supposed to do this. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, so the next morning, we were signed up for classes. I said, whoa, babe, that was fast. <laughs> do you, yes? Are you ready to pick up the, we're going to do this, right? I thought maybe a confirmation. Chase, we're three dreams deep. <laughs> yeah, this is a big decision, though, babe. Let's get a few more fleeces out there. Let's just make sure. Let's double check our math here. I've never been a dad. You know, no, we're supposed to do this. Start going to classes. I'm like, wow, six months? Okay, I got six months. I got four months. Oh, my gosh, I'm out of time. We're trained. Okay, babe, are you? Chase, we prayed. All right, I'm in. Let's do it. December 21, 2018 rolls around. I get a phone call. Hey, Chase is all across. You're the only long-term family available right now. We've got a 17-day-old. He needs a home. He can go to emergency homes for a little bit, but you're the only long-term placement. It'd be great if he could be in a long-term home. Um, has some stuff going on. It's his story to share, but he has some stuff going on. Um, would you be willing to take him into your, your home? And then, I don't know if any of the bros can uh, resonate with this. Sometimes when it comes to like future casting things, I'm not the greatest. I have to almost like see it. So I'm like, well, can I pray? Yeah, get back to me fast though because it needs to be today. I was like, okay. Like, like, like I'm gonna go, we're gonna get him today? Don't you need to like make sure he's okay? Yeah, we've been doing that for 17 days. He needs a home today. And I was like, well... We don't have a car seat. Well, you can find one. I'm sure someone have one. Okay, okay. <laughs> hey, babe, let's pray. And I love, let me tell you, I love the goosebump love encounter with God, and I think that we need to have a thousand more of them. I really do. I'm not, don't hear what I'm saying today. I'm not diminishing that. The love of Christ is what fuels me. Knowing him is what fuels me. This is what leads us to picking up the cross, because I get to know something far more glorious than any trial this world could throw my way. So we're praying, but it was a different prayer time. It hit like, oh, this is gonna cost. That's the one thing the Lord said. It will be costly, but it will be worth it. And I remember just sitting there. I'm like, well, let's call our parents. Hey, guys. They're like, are you guys ready? I'm like, no. They're like, all right. And we get to the hospital. And Lindy's like talking to the nurses. There's this little boy named Parker. And she's like getting the formula and stuff. And I started to feel like a little lightheaded. I'm like, whoa. You guys are giving him to us? I've never taken care of one before. I almost passed out just so that. If you pick up a cross and you don't quite make it all the way, that's all right. 
I sit down, and I'm like, I don't feel the best. And she looks at me, and she's got fierce love. She's the same on stages off. She's like, you gonna be okay? I'm like, for sure. <laughs> in a few days, yes. Lock in. I look at him. I'm like, Parker, I'm gonna treat you like my son because today you're making me a dad and you're making Lindy a mom. And I don't know what your story will be. I hope it goes to reunification. That's always the goal. But no matter the cost, I have one thing that I can do right now. I can love you unconditionally the way that Christ loves me. It won't be perfect. It'll be full of flaws, but I'm gonna bring, we're gonna love you. And can I tell you, the journey was not easy. I love to tell you, man, it was like we came home and then the glory hit. And it was like angels were singing in the corners. No, it felt like every angel left. It was like, whoa, what are diapers? What's happening? What's sleep? I forgot. But through his journey, we loved him. We loved his mom. Still are. It's still an unfolding journey. And five years into this journey, I don't regret one second saying yes to what was costly, what God was inviting us into. And it was costly for me and Lydia. My whole life actually changed. I was leading outreach missions tours to universities. I was one of the leaders, preachers. I love to preach. I don't know if you can tell. It's fun. But when I said yes to that, we had visits. I could no longer travel. You had to get court approval to travel. And Lindy had um, best languages. Like she had this worship career, this thing that was exploding and going. And she was wrestling like, whoa, I can't do ABC. I can't do maybe a tour or this. And the Lord challenged us, is not obedience the highest form of worship? Didn't I say to do this? Isn't it about the one? And I felt like this cross began to form a new heart of love in me. And as I was getting crushed from my own expectations, what I thought things might look like, I realized I was discovering a joy of knowing Jesus in ways I never thought I could know him. I discovered an adoptive love of Jesus. That's the only way I could make it through is that his grace started pouring out in our home. That was the only way to make it through. Maybe it's not foster care. Maybe you're in high school and you're like, man, if I go bold for Jesus, I'm not just gonna get made fun of. I'm gonna get for real bullied online and in real life. And it's not easy. It isn't easy. But can I tell you, if you take a stand for Jesus, there's probably a few in your high school that are waiting for you to take a stand. And they're probably longing for your voice and your love for Jesus to shine through into their broken life. And the only reason people bully is because they're so empty on the inside. They've got no real love on the inside. So they're looking to tear other people down to where they're at. And if you take a stand, it will change that kid's life. Or maybe you're in business and your business is crushing it and you know the Lord's been inviting you into like the most generous season of your life and you're like, Lord, that is scary. How am I gonna do this? But the Lord's been putting it on your heart and you're gonna pay an extraordinary price and you're not gonna tell anybody you're gonna go Bible on it and it's gonna change people's lives. Whatever the cross that God is, or maybe you have a prodigal kid and you've been praying for years, Lord, bring him home. And the cross of a prodigal son or daughter is so crushing and the Lord is here today to give you a cup of cold water. Don't Give up, pick up the cross, keep praying. I'm faithful, I hear every prayer, I hear every, I see every tear. Don't give up, pick up the cross of intercession and pray and pray until there's breakthrough. Whatever your cross is, I'm telling you, everybody has one. It might be simple, one time for me, it was for me calling my dad and asking for his forgiveness for how I had been as a son. I'd gotten super bitter at him, super bitter at him and my mom when they split up. And he wasn't perfect. I had to forgive him. Sometimes you gotta pick up that cross of forgiveness and let people off the hook. Whatever it is, to be a true follower of Christ, you've gotta pick up that cross. That hard thing, that challenging thing, that is the way of Jesus. If we want resurrection life, there is no resurrection life without the cross. The cross is what makes a way for resurrection life to flow through us. Keep going for the sake of time. Who does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I know I'm, a, okay, I said this at the beginning. I don't want you to hear this as like a beat down message. I feel like a lot of you guys are living as disciples. I'm hoping that today's encouraging. Like I've counted the cost, Chase, I'm in. It's just for those who are like, man, I need to count the cost. I need to sign up afresh. I've never signed up. I need to today. Let's keep going real quick. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate 
whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. We've got to really think about the practical implications of saying yes to Jesus. It will be practical. It will touch our finances. Trust me, touch my eyes like, man, Lord, Florida, a lot cheaper, easier. To live missionally, Lord, thank you. It will touch your family. It will, it will cost, right? It will, you have to really think about that. Me following Jesus, it's gonna change every relationship in my life. I have friends in high school. I stopped going to the parties. I stopped going to the drinking moment. I became water boy chase. I had to embrace my reputation changing. I had to embrace like, man, that didn't feel good, Lord. Bro, small price, you get me for eternity. You're worried about what five guys think about you? What about what I think about you? I love every yes that you give me. You're my friend. Oh, that's sweeter than anything I could have ever tasted in friendship with those guys. Exactly. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Come to know me. Count the cost, Chase. Think about the implications. And really think about it, because here's the deal. If we really think about it, and we really start to compare what it will cost compared to what we gain, the scales aren't even close. It's pennies to endless riches. Oh, but Lord, it costs this. But you get me. And guess what? When you die, you still get me. Because I'm the life and resurrection. I'll bring you back to life for eternity. But Lord, this might be hard. Yeah, it's momentary light affliction, eternal weight of glory. Come on over here. We've got to really practically count the cost. But I think when we do, when we think critically, this life is so brief, so short, it's so easy to say, you know what? Come what may, I don't care what it costs, I'm following Jesus. Though it costs me a life, I'm following Jesus. Last thing as we wrap up. If not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Wait a second. What's this random thing about salt here at the end? Okay, back in the day, in Jesus' day, salt was used uh, for seasoning and for preservation. And they got salt from the Dead Sea salt flats. So they would get salt from the Dead Sea. And if you have salt, salt is salt. You can't really and purify it. But back then, there was clean, pure salt, and then there was salt that wouldn't have been like the top layer. It wouldn't have been clean salt. It would have been muddied by the, the earth, by the dirt, and it would have been bland and good for nothing. So what Jesus is saying here is, if you're totally devoted, if you're a sold out follower of me, you're going to have flavor and you're going to be preserved all your days. But if you've got some of the world in you, if you're half in, half out, if you've got a little bit of unconfessed sin that you don't wanna deal with, you got some things that I've been tugging on your heart you're not gonna deal with, it's not like, oh, you're gonna kinda of make it. It's like, no, you aren't worth, you, aren't, you can't expand the kingdom of God. And it's not perfection. No, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying it's that your heart is all in and following him. We're gonna be sanctified all our lives. Guess what? I still sin. But my heart is fixed on, I wanna be like you. I wanna confess anything. Transform me to look more like you, Jesus, because the world needs Jesus, not me. If there's any way that's dirty in me, if there's ways of the world, clear it out because I want to be salty. I want to stay salty my whole life. When you come around me, I want you to get the flavor of Jesus where your life is enriched and you want to run your race with everything inside of you. I think that's the cry of Zion Church. I think there is a longing for Southern California to wake up to wholehearted Christianity, which is the only Christianity. Many of you are already, are already living this. I want to encourage you, keep going. Keep picking up the cross when it's hard. Know that he's with you. Know that he loves you. And for others of you, I'm almost out of time, but for others of you, maybe you have a little dance. You're like, man, I don't know if I am salty. I think I got some compromise in my life. I think I've gone to church maybe two, three times. Chase, I'm new here, man. I know I got some stuff I gotta deal with. Can I give you some good news? Your effort isn't what purifies you and makes you salty. It's the grace of Jesus is the starting line. If you will say yes to the cost, if you will say yes to giving him your life, because guess what? You can't receive a free gift if you're still holding on to the old thing. Salvation is free. It's grace by faith that we are saved. There's nothing we could do to earn it. That's the starting line. But you can't receive that free gift if you're holding on to your old life. 
So if you're here today and you've never surrendered to Jesus and you've never said yes to a wholehearted life of following him, you're like, I don't wanna just hear, I don't wanna just have a goosebump, I wanna give him my whole heart, I wanna follow him all my days, I wanna be a sold out believer, I wanna follow Jesus with everything inside of me. I wanna tell you today that when Jesus hung on that cross, arms out wide, and he said, it is finished, the price was paid for your sin and for mine. Whatever you feel like separating you was destroyed in that moment when Jesus breathed his last, it is finished. While he hung up there, he didn't breathe judgment. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So if you feel like being a sold out believer is too hard for you, it's not your efforts, it's the grace of God that's gonna be the starting line. And it's the grace of God that's gonna fuel us anyway. So if you feel like it's your effort, no, you're in good company. We can never do it. But Jesus made a way for you and for me to be forgiven and to be empowered by grace to live a life that looks like him. So if you're here today and you're not sure, today is your day of salvation. The Bible says if you confess through your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. What are you confessing? You're confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Repenting of sins, what does that mean? You're turning and walking the other direction. You're walking your own way, doing your own thing, and then you turn and you are changing your mindset. You are following Jesus with everything inside you. That's repentance right there. Whatever sin, God, you can have all of it, Lord. Forgive all of it. I'm following you with everything inside of me. If that's you today, today is your day to respond to the love of Christ. He's after your heart. He's after all of it. He loves you so much. That's why I went an extra minute. Please forgive me. But if you're here today and you want to surrender to Jesus and you're not sure you ever really have, no question. I don't want anyone to walk out the doors wondering. You don't want to wonder about your eternity. You don't want to wonder about the rest of your life. If you're here today wondering, Today's the day where the love of God is reaching out for your heart and saying, would you surrender to me afresh? In just a moment, you're gonna make a bold move. I'm gonna ask you to stand up, eyes open. Why do I do that? I believe a bold confession before Jesus, he will boldly confess you before his Father. If you're here today, who cares what anyone thinks? You're saying yes to the greatest thing you could ever say yes to, Jesus himself. It's not about saying yes to me. It's not about saying yes to me. It's about saying yes. It's about saying yes to Jesus. This is a moment between you and him. The eternal, uncreated God is beckoning your heart. It might be pounding right now. His love is pulling you. So if that's you, you're here today. On the count of three, I'm gonna give you opportunity to stand to your feet. And then you're gonna come up here and join me. I'm gonna have a prayer team gonna pray for you, okay? But if that's you, on the count of three, stand to your feet. One, two, three. call, but I'm totally fine with signs. I, I feel it in my heart. I know it. I do. I just feel there's somebody here today where the Lord has been coming after your heart. I'm blocking the lights because I just want you to see like the Lord's love is after your heart. I got one more call today, but I'm telling you, there's somebody here today where the Lord's saying, come home. Surrender your life to me. My love is for real. I'm after you. I don't care if I look like a fool. I really don't. There's somebody here today. Come on. If you're here, stand up. Don't wait for another count. Just go ahead, stand up right now. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Come on. That's it. Let's go. Come on. And then prayer team, if somebody could come join her. Come on. My other call is really, really simple. If there's anyone here today, you're like, man, I've been halfway in. There's some things I got to deal with. I want to sign up afresh for wholeheartedly following Jesus. He's supreme. I'm, pick, I'm picking up my cross. I've counted the cost. You can have anything, Lord. If there's someone here today like, I just need to tell the Lord, I'm signing up afresh today. If that's you, just to tell the Lord, I want you to stand up with me too. You just want to tell the Lord that you're signing up afresh, wholeheartedly to follow him with everything inside of you. Go ahead and stand up right now. Come on. So good. So good. Anyone else? The Lord's pulling on your heart for a fresh surrender. Okay, why don't we all stand? Thanks for letting me go a few minutes over. We're gonna pray something, then we're gonna celebrate the blood of Jesus that launches us into our life of picking up our cross. Sound good? Say this with me together. Jesus! One more time, a little louder. Jesus! We're surrendered to you. We say yes to following you with all of our hearts. 
with all of our mind, with all our strength, we sign up for the cost of following you. Thank you for the blood that made a way.